At a Siberian site dated to 417,000 years ago, researchers uncovered evidence of hearths, stone flakes, and large mammal bones with cut marks. Though fragmentary, this material indicates that humans had already adapted to the boreal landscapes of the north. The presence of hearths is particularly telling. Fire was not just a tool for cooking, but a shield against cold, insects, and predators. For humans venturing into regions with long winters, fire mastery was non-negotiable. 400,000 years ago, the frozen expanses of Siberia were not the desolate landscapes we picture today. Instead, the land was green, dotted with boreal forests, open meadows, and swelling rivers that drained into the Arctic. This was one of the planet's super-interglacials, a warm interval that rivaled or exceeded our own Holocene in temperature and productivity. Ice sheets retreated, coastlines shifted, and vast corridors opened in regions that we now associate only with permafrost and tundra. It was in this world that early humans, descendants of Homo erectus, such as Peking Man, pushed northward into the edge of Siberia, standing at the very doorstep of Beringia. This period, around 400,000 years ago, is often overlooked in the grand story of human migration. Scholars tend to focus on much later dispersals, the crossings of Beringia during the last glacial maximum, or the early Homo sapiens expansions across Eurasia. Yet the archaeological and paleo-environmental record suggests that archaic humans, equipped with clothing, fire, and surprisingly complex tools, could have ventured far into the north long before our species appeared. The possibility that humans reached Northeast Asia during this super-interglacial and may even have crossed into the Americas during a moment when the Bering Land Bridge briefly re-emerged forces us to rethink the deep prehistory of both continents. The climate of marine isotope stage 11, beginning around 424,000 years ago and lasting until 374,000 years ago, was one of the warmest and longest interglacials of the past half million years. Global sea levels rose as high as or higher than today, submerging many coastal plains. Yet paradoxically, the dynamics of ice sheets in Greenland and North America suggest that Beringia could have periodically re-emerged even without a full glaciation event. All that was required was a slight regional cooling, enough to lower sea level by 150 feet. During this time, Siberia's ecosystems flourished, Fossil pollen, animal remains, and lake cores reveal a patchwork of mixed coniferous and deciduous forests interspersed with grasslands that supported herds of grazing animals. Mammoths, which had already evolved in Eurasia, began their great expansion towards the New World. Genetic studies of mammoth DNA suggest that they crossed into North America around 420,000 years ago, mingling with the native mammoth populations and giving rise to new lineages. If mammoths could migrate across this northern land bridge, why not humans? The most striking piece of evidence for human presence in Northeast Asia 400,000 years ago comes from the site of Dering Yuryak on the Lena River in central Siberia. This location has dramatically altered our view of early human dispersals into high latitudes. Discovered in 1982, Dering Yuryak remained controversial for decades until advances in dating techniques finally clarified its age. But the true significance only became apparent when new methods of cosmogenic nuclide dating were applied to the sediments. The results placed the site at 417,000 years old, pushing back the record of human occupation in Siberia by hundreds of thousands of years. The Dyring Yuriak assemblage consists of primitive stone tools buried in wind-blown sand layers. These implements are not finely worked bifaces or delicate blades, but rather a simple toolkit of flakes and cores, likely used for cutting meat, scraping hides, and basic woodworking. While unspectacular at first glance, their very presence at such a northerly latitude during the middle Pleistocene is revolutionary. Tools do not transport themselves. Their makers had to be hardy, mobile, and capable of adapting to seasonal extremes. What species of human occupied Dyering Yuriak remains uncertain, as no bones have been found. The most plausible candidates are populations of Homo erectus, perhaps related to the Peking Man groups further south in China. If so, these Siberian pioneers 
represent the northernmost advance of Erectus yet documented. Given that Erectus elsewhere was already experimenting with hafted spears, drilling techniques and clothing production, it is likely that the toolmakers at Diring Uriak possessed similar capacities, even if the artifacts preserved there appear simple. The dating of 417,000 years coincides with Marine Isotope Stage 11, the Super Interglacial, when Siberia was covered in forests and meadows, rather than permafrost. This warm climate would have eased the path of migration northward. John Jansen of the Czech Academy of Sciences, who presented the results, emphasized that the occupation perfectly corresponds with the interglacial. He argued that humans could expand during warm phases, but were likely forced south again when glacial conditions returned. Diring Uriak also holds significance for the question of Beringia and the Americas. Though about 1,200 miles from the Bering Strait, it demonstrates that humans were within reach of the corridor. As Janssen noted, if groups had persisted closer to the Arctic coast during cooler intervals, when sea levels dipped, they might have been poised to cross into Alaska, either by land bridge or via seasonal sea ice. If they hung on there during colder periods when the sea level was lower, they might have been able to reach North America. They would have been within striking distance of crossing the strait during low sea level, Jansen said. And also, of course, there is the possibility of crossing sea ice. But this is just speculation, he said. The diring tools themselves, though often called primitive, carry enormous implications. Their survival in layers of wind-blown sand suggests that humans were present long enough to leave behind recognisable traces of habitation, not just fleeting visits. The stone artefacts show signs of purposeful flaking, not random breakage. The lack of fire remains or worked bone may reflect preservation bias rather than absence, since sandy and open contexts do not favour the survival of organic materials. In the end, Deering Uriak is a sentinel site, a lonely outpost marking the northernmost reach of archaic humans nearly half a million years ago. Its age forces us to imagine a world where Homo erectus, clad in hides and carrying simple stone tools, moved through Siberian forests during warm summers, perhaps following herds of mammoths and reindeer. These humans stood at the edge of a continent, with Alaska just over the horizon. Whether they ever crossed we may never know, but the sight proves that they stood within striking distance. To understand the humans who may have ventured into Siberia during this interglacial, we must look southward to the better documented hominins of China. Peking Man, the population of Homo erectus inhabiting Chokudian near Beijing, thrived from around 500,000 years ago. These people mastered fire, lived in caves for shelter, and developed stone tools that show increasing sophistication through time. One of the most striking discoveries from Chinese Middle Pleistocene sites is the evidence of bone and stone drilling. Awls, perforators, and pointed implements suggest that these hominins were experimenting with techniques that required precision and forethought. Combined with cut-marked bones and the clear use of fire for cooking, this indicates a level of behavioral flexibility often underestimated in archaic humans. Perhaps most intriguingly, Faunal remains from Chinese sites show that Peking man hunted animals not only for meat, but for reasons we still do not fully understand. Beavers, for example, appear frequently in the archaeological record. Their fur and hides could have been valuable for clothing or insulation, but some cut-marked bones suggest that they were also targeted in specific ways that hint at symbolic or ritual practices. Whatever the reason, these hominins were not simply scavenging, they were deliberate hunters with cultural patterns of resource use. One of the pivotal debates in paleoanthropology is when humans first began wearing tailored clothing. By 400,000 years ago, evidence from both morphology and artefacts suggests that at least some populations were doing so. If these humans were already experimenting with clothing made of fur, bone tools for piercing hides, and seasonal hunting strategies in northern China, the leap into Siberia was not inconceivable. Direct archaeological evidence from Siberia around 400,000 years ago remains sparse, partly because permafrost and erosion obscure many sites. However, a handful of middle Pleistocene localities provide tantalizing hints. The stone tools found in the Lena River region, as well as those in the Lake Baikal region, 
bear resemblance to the toolkits of contemporaneous Chinese hominins like Peking Man. Together, these clues suggest that archaic humans were testing the limits of their range. They may have moved seasonally, following herds of mammoth, horse, and reindeer. They may have congregated at rivers where fish and beaver were plentiful, and they may have lingered in sheltered valleys that offered both wood and game. The Jokudian hominins lived in caves where temperatures in winter would have been freezing, making fire and insulation essential. Stone tools with wear traces consistent with hide scraping appear at several Chinese and Siberian sites. Moreover, bone awls, tools that could puncture hides for sewing, have been recovered in middle Pleistocene contexts. While no needles survive from this early period, the circumstantial evidence points strongly toward the use of clothing. If these humans dressed in layered hides, it would have transformed their ability to colonize the North. Clothing extends the ecological niche of a species in a way that no other technology can. It makes the uninhabitable habitable, opening up territories that would otherwise be lethal. For humans, 400,000 years ago, clothing may have been the key that unlocked Siberia. We often think of Beringia, the land bridge that once connected Siberia and Alaska, as a feature of the Ice Age, exposed only during times of maximum glaciation. Yet the geological record shows that it did not require the crushing weight of full ice sheets to appear. Even modest declines in sea level of 50 meters could expose vast tracts of the Bering continental shelf. During the super-interglacial, fluctuating climates may have periodically revealed this land bridge. For mammoths, horses and bison, these windows of opportunity were enough to allow migration. The genetic evidence for mammoths in North America around 420,000 years ago demonstrates that such a crossing occurred. Humans, opportunistic and mobile, could have followed the same path, if they did, their presence in Alaska would have been brief and perhaps archaeologically invisible. Small bands could have explored, hunted, and even left descendants, only to be later overwhelmed by environmental changes or replaced by later migrants. Yet even the possibility forces us to confront a radical idea that the human story in the Americas may have roots far deeper than we ever imagined. The mammoths are more than a side note in this story. They are central characters. Their migration into North America 400,000 years ago shows that the land bridge was open and viable. It also shows that ecosystems on both sides were sufficiently similar to support large herbivores, and growing populations of humans and mammoths would have sought new lands to colonize. For humans, mammoths were both resource and rival. They provided meat, hides, bones for tools, and possibly even symbolic value but they also required coordinated hunting strategies and courage. Following mammoths across Siberia would have been logical, for their migrations pointed toward reliable pastures and water sources. The genetic blending of Eurasian and American mammoth lineages around 420,000 years ago is therefore more than a zoological curiosity. It is indirect evidence of a corridor that humans could also have traversed. If mammoths, weighing several tons, could cross, so too could bands of fur-clad hunters armed with fire and stone. The fact that mammoths crossed into North America around 420,000 years ago, creating hybrid populations with Native American mammoths, proves that large mammals were already making this journey at the very same time humans were in Siberia. The emphasis on beaver hunting in Chinese Middle Pleistocene sites raises questions about the cultural world of these archaic humans. Beavers are not the easiest prey. They live in water, build lodges, and are often trapped rather than pursued. The fact that hominins deliberately targeted them suggests more than subsistence. Beaver teeth, for example, are naturally sharp and could be repurposed as tools. Their fur was dense and waterproof, ideal for cold climates. But perhaps there was also symbolic meaning attached to the animal, a recognition of its unique behaviors of building and altering landscapes. The evidence of drilling whether in bones, teeth or stones, adds another layer. Drilling requires rotational force, precision and patience. It could have been used to create ornaments, half tools or experiment with composite technologies. These are not the actions of mere opportunists. They reflect minds capable of planning and abstraction.
Taken together, these cultural markers suggest that the humans who approached Siberia were not simply surviving. They were innovating, experimenting, and perhaps even telling stories about the animals they hunted. The evidence from Northeast Asia hints that the climate was not a barrier. Instead, it may have been an invitation. Warm summers, reliable water, and abundant large mammals created conditions in which archaic humans could have thrived. What if early humans did cross into Alaska 400,000 years ago? Would we find traces of them today? The most likely answer is no, at least not easily. Archaeological preservation in Alaska and the Yukon is poor for organic materials that old, and any traces could have been buried under later deposits or eroded away. Genetic evidence is also unlikely to survive from such deep time. Yet the possibility remains tantalizing. If small groups established themselves in North America 400,000 years ago, they may have persisted for millennia before vanishing, replaced by later arrivals during subsequent glaciations. Such a scenario would mirror the story of the Denisovans in Asia, ghost populations whose genetic echoes remain but whose fossils are few. The story of humans at the doorstep of Beringia 400,000 years ago is not one of definitive fossils or indisputable artifacts. It is a story built from climate records, animal migrations, and the surprising capacities of archaic humans in Asia. It is the story of a warm super-interglacial that opened the north, of peaking man clad in furs and experimenting with drilling, of mammoths crossing into Alaska, and of a world where the Americas may not have been as isolated as we once thought. Thank you for watching.